So I'm, I'm Neil Young from uh, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, and I'm here with Dr. Richard Stone from uh, Harvard Medical School uh, to uh, summarize for patients and family members and uh, interested lay people, the excellent uh, Aplosconemia MDS Foundation symposium that was held virtually uh, this year uh, in the during the last uh, three days here in July. Uh, so I wanted to start by asking uh, Richard if he would talk about the uh, opening session, which was dedicated to the genomics and genetics of marrow failure and uh, specifically aplosconemia, myelodysplastic syndrome, leukemia predisposition. Rich? Rich? Thank you, Neil. I must say first that the entire symposium really represented uh, about 12 of the best scientists or clinical scientists we have in uh, around the world who are dealing with bone marrow failure states. And the research that was discussed by these august individuals really is going to help the care of patients uh, right now and in the future who have these conditions. So that's that's number one, two, three, and four of, the, of my take home from this, this conference. The virtual uh, pattern worked really well. The setup was good. We had good interaction. And the speakers, as I already alluded to, were great. Well, the first session, as you mentioned, was dedicated to the genetics of bone marrow failure. And we had a couple of super talks to start uh, dealing with the pathophysiology or the way aplastic anemia uh, evolves over time. And it's one of the more important things was that the, uh, the, the genetics that define us as self, the HLA system, actually undergoes changes as a plastic anemia evolves. And these are the genes that control our ability to recognize self and actually help determine who's going to be a good transplant donor for the next person. So this is going to have the research that was discussed is going to have important implications for stem cell transplant in, in a plastic anemia. Further, we are now learning a lot more about the genetics of inherited bone marrow failure syndromes. When I was a fellow, we thought people with MDS uh, rarely uh, had uh, a family history of it or had genes that they carried in all their cells that might predispose them to these diseases, which by and large occur in older adults. Yet, we now know there's a number of system uh, syndromes, well over a dozen, maybe two dozen, that uh, involve uh, genes that one carries in the germline. And still, the majority of patients have uh, abnormalities that they acquired during life, but a sizable minority and more and more that are being recognized every day even in patients who present late in life may have genetic abnormalities, which means that for patients uh, should be ready to discuss with their physicians if they have one of these bone marrow failure states, whether they have a family history, whether they have certain other features, which Dr. Young has described uh, for many years now that might suggest uh, certain genetic syndromes. And then we uh, heard a lot more about the, in the individual genetic changes that can occur in mild dysplastic syndrome patients and for that matter, also in uh, hereditary bone marrow failure syndromes. Uh, we're particularly struck by the talk by uh, Dr. Coleman Lindsley at my institution, uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, who discussed the uh, evolution of Schwachmann-Diamond syndrome. Uh, and uh, uh, this really can, uh, it's an inherited bone marrow failure state, but uh, with a high predisposition to going on to leukemia. And Dr. Lindsley's really dissected the genetics about this, and some of his observations may help determine when, if and when a patient should have a stem cell transplant uh, to prevent uh, trans, uh, transformation to acute leukemia. So there's a lot packed into that first day, having to do with the genetics and genomics of bone marrow failure states. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And I, I think it's not only that it's gonna be medically important to the patients, but with this explosion in genomics, this ability to really look at the sequence and expression of dozens and dozens of genes that are either abnormal at birth or can become abnormal over, uh, over a person's life. It's, biologically, it's of extraordinary interest. The architecture is extra really complex, and I think it's going to be illuminating not only for marrow failure, but for lots of other uh, human diseases. We can get marrow, we can get blood from our willing patients to do these analyses, and I think they're going to be very meaningful in all of medicine. Absolutely. Now, in the second day, we had two sessions, one dealing with transplanta transplantation of bone marrow failure, and the second one with some very interesting new data 
about how to treat uh, bone marrow failure without a transplant. Neil, why don't you summarize that? You were the chair of the second of those two sessions. Yeah, the, the transplant session um, was of great interest. Uh, the Hopkins group presented through Amy Desern their results with haploidentical transplant, but Amy also gave a lovely overview of haploidentical transplants as they've been used, especially in China. These are uh, increasingly popular because there are transplants that can be done for virtually any patient, uh, as long as they have some family member who is at least half uh, 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 half identical at HLA, and that's almost always a father, mother, the biological father, mother, and a sibling. And the results with the regimen that's been developed in Baltimore using post-transplant cyclophosphamide in a limited number of patients that they've done that uh, they've um, uh, uh, transplanted have really been spectacular with uh, excellent overlong, uh, overall survival and very little uh, chronic graft versus host disease, which is the uh, major undesired outcome, the major toxicity of transplant, especially in adults. So that's very important work. There's a uh, great movement worldwide to explore this uh, approach of haploidentical transplant and marrow failure syndromes in which the graft versus leukemia or graft versus tumor effect is undesirable. And the important, uh, the important feature is to uh, the important goal is to get a new bone marrow that produces both uh, hematopoietic and immune cells into the patient. We also heard a summary of transplant and Fanconi anemia uh, from uh, Carmina, one of our uh, stellar Brazilian colleagues. Uh, Brazil has been a leader in uh, transplant of patients with this particular type of constitutional uh, aplastic anemia dating now back uh, multiple decades. And really, the re I, I was really struck by the successful outcome in, in resolving the hematopoietic defect in patients with Fanconi anemia, uh, especially coming from Brazil, but now replicated worldwide. Uh, I think the unfortunate uh, um, uh, features of her talk were that this approach has not worked quite as well in some of the other common marrow failure syndromes. That's, for example, in the telomeropathies or telomer disease, where other organ failures often um, uh, impact on the outcomes of patients. But again, there's a, a marker of success, a model of success with Fanconi anemia that will be followed with modulations of the transplant regimen that I think will benefit other patients with constitutional marrow failure. The second session that you alluded to, Rich, was on non-transplant treatments. These still dominate uh, because most patients don't undergo transplant. And uh, Bavisha Patel from my institution, from the NIH, uh, summarize the long-term data uh, in our patients who have been treated uh, with a, a regimen that's now approved based on NIH studies that combines standard immunosuppression with L-trauma PAG. The first talk came from Antonio Risitano, which was brief because the results of a randomized trial to confirm the NIH data have not been officially uh, uh, publicized. That comes in just a few weeks uh, in Europe. But the RACE study uh, randomized patients between conventional immunosuppression and immunosuppression with the addition of L-trombopag. And it appears that uh, the study met its endpoints, which was an improvement in the, uh, uh, the complete response rate, but that was significantly above what's been observed historically and was also significantly better in this randomized study. Also a better uh, overall response rate. So confirming that L-trombopag does add to the treatment of patients with aplastic anemia. That was a study in adults uh, that was performed uh, throughout Europe. In the long-term follow-up from NIH, uh, uh, Bavisha really characterized the, 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 the toxicities that we worry about, the adverse events that we worry about beyond restoring hematopoiesis in the first few months, uh, which l pack is quite successful at improving. Relapse remains a problem. Um, relapse is becoming increasingly hard to define because you know, modest changes in platelet counts when platelet counts start at 100 or 150,000 may not truly represent relapse. But this becomes, this is a problem. It's occurring in 30 to 40% of patients. And Bavisha described ongoing trials at the NIH that are using other immunomodulatory drugs to reduce this complication. Fortunately, relapse can be treated uh, in most patients when it occurs with uh, reintroduction of cyclosporine or even a repeat of immunosuppression. Uh, so the results, uh, uh, th th the other important outcome is that there's no increase in clonal cytogenetic or somatic mutation abnormalities, uh, this phenomenon of clonal evolution that occurs in a significant minority of patients with aplastic anemia in this treatment-naive setting. In other words, patients who are coming to 
definitive therapy for the first time. There's no increase in the rate of these clonal evolutionary events with the addition of El Trombo I think that that is uh, good news. But they may be occurring earlier, which may also be good news because it gets patients to uh, transplant if they need it at earlier stage of their disease. So I think both the transplant and the non-transplant sessions presented a lot of new, highly pertinent uh, medical information that should be beneficial to patients uh, who are looking at the prospects of therapy for the first time. Rich, do you want to uh, take us into the second day um, where the focus was more on myelodysplastic syndrome? For, uh, the final day, which was today, we discussed, uh, uh, we had four superb talks about uh, therapeutic interventions and the pathophysiological basis for those uh, in the uh, in the myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, the first talk was by one of our uh, leading young MDS investigators in the country, David Salmon from H. Lee Moffat Cancer Center in Tampa, who talked about novel strategies to treat one of the most difficult subtypes of MDS, namely that caused or in association with a P53 mutation. Now we look at the blood counts, the number of blasts in the marrow, the chromosomes, but also at the genetics of the patient uh, with MDS. And if they have a P53 mutation, often associated with adverse chromosomal abnormalities, we know that we've got a very difficult clinical situation in front of us. Uh, and uh, heretofore, we've had limited useful therapies for this condition. We've had uh, oral nucleotides like azacitabine or decitabine. And recently, we've been using venetoclax, a BCL2 inhibitor, along with azacitabine for AML. But uh, there's, and that regimen has been approved for AML, but in MDS, we really haven't moved off the uh, hypomethylene agent dime for quite a while. Well, David talked about two exciting drugs. One is called APR246, which refolds this misfolded uh, mutated protein. Allegedly, that's how it works, and there seemed to be a high response rate when combined with the traditional azacitidine. And as at least as exciting, uh, the drug magrolimab, which is an antibody that has a spectacularly interesting mechanism of action. It covers up CD47, which is the so-called don't eat me signal present on the surface of the MDS cell, which prevents uh, the macrophages or the uh, immune cells from eating it up and killing the bad cell. Well, if you cover up the don't eat me signal, perhaps the cells can be eaten. And indeed, combining H uh, azacitidine with magrolimab, very high response rate, even in P53 mutant patients. So we're gonna be looking at randomized trials that are being done now to prove that adding one of those new agents to azacitidine is better than azacitidine alone. Then Amit Verma from uh, Montefiore and Einstein talked about the TGF beta pathway, which accounts for the anemia of MDS. This, these are evil humors or bad cytokines that are released by the MDS cells, which give the patient anemia, which can be quite uh, difficult to deal with. His research has led to a newly approved agent called loose patercept, which binds some of these evil humors and allows the anemia to be improved. And some of his research will be used to come up with even better or more effective therapies to combat the anemia that's ubiquitous in MDS patients, particularly those with low risk disease. And then my colleague at the MGH, uh, Mass General in Boston, Tim Graubert, uh, superb scientist and head of the hematology division there, uh, or hematology malignancy division there, uh, talked about using splicing inhibitor drugs to treat MDS. What is that about? Because well, uh, we need to uh, change the messenger RNA molecules that are transcribed from our DNA code to allow proteins to be made. And there's these enzymes called splicing enzymes that sort of nip and tuck the messenger RNA to uh, express genes more uh, appropriately. It turns out mutations in enzymes that do this are common in MDS. And if you've got one mutation in one enzyme, you knock out the other one, the MDS cell dies. That's called uh, synthetic lethality. Uh, and uh, Tim, Tim's research has been fantastic in coming up with new agents that might do this. Right now, there haven't, haven't been any splicing inhibitor drugs that have been fantastically uh, great, but uh, we have a couple of leads which we're tracking down right now, which Tim described. And finally, Toyosio Niki, a uh, fantastic uh, clinical scientist from the University of Chicago, talked about oral azonucleotides in MDS and AML. And uh, we've used these uh, drugs, which I alluded to, for quite a while, um, called decidabine and azacitidine. But recently, just last week on July 7th, uh, a new drug was approved called uh, 
uh, oral decitabine with a cytidine deaminase inhibitor, which means it packaged as two drugs in one pill. Uh, and it may obviate the need for patients to come into the clinic five or seven days in a row to get treated for their MDS. So uh, this is going to be a, a great boon, and it's going to make it easier to combine uh, these oral agents with other things, which might make the response rate even higher. So the uh, AAMDS Foundation heard about really a, a game changer for the last uh, 25 years. We've been using these IV or sub-Q compounds, and now we may be able to use an oral agent, which is going to be great for patients. So there was a lot of optimism uh, today in MDS uh, that we heard about from our, our wonderful speakers. So it was a very exciting session, and uh, I was very enthusiastic about it. And uh, Neil, I'll turn it over to you for any closing comments. Yeah, I think it was really a wonderful conference. Uh, we missed seeing each other in person, uh, but it worked virtually. We had a much larger audience, which I uh, hope, as we, we, we both uh, discussed at the end, we hope leads to uh, an expansion of the community of people interested in marrow failure physicians and uh, scientists, especially young investigators. I, I want to really give credit, as, uh, as we did at the end of the conference, to uh, Neil Horoshoki and, uh, and to Alice uh, Hauk for pushing pushing us to go forward in the middle of this pandemic in the interests of the patients um, and the interests of uh, uh, families of patients with uh, aploscopy with the conference. They were both uh, affected as everyone is affected by the impact of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And in the end, this was the right decision to make and we owe it to their leadership to uh, have this be successful. And of course, we're very thankful to the chairs and to the investigators who put together this wonderful work. It was really stirring from beginning to end. Um, so I think we're the ones who are uh, grateful for what was achieved in these last several days. Rich, it was terrific being a co-chair with you as always. As always, I'm honored. Thank you. <laughs>